I am incredibly honored and grateful and feel it's a privilege to be up here uh, discussing um, this groundbreaking documentary and to introduce two of the men that put this together. Uh, Mark Samuels was named executive producer of American Experience, PBS's flagship history series in 2003. Under his leadership, the series has been honored with nearly every industry award, including, get comfortable, the Peabody Primetime <laughs> Emmys, the DuPont Columbia Journalism Award, the Writers Guild Award, let me sit down, Oscar nominations, <laughs> the Sundance Film Festival audience, and Grand, that's it? The Grand, okay. So prior to touring WGBF, uh, he worked as an independent documentary filmmaker and executive producer for several US public television stations and as a producer for the first co-production between Japanese and American television a native of Wisconsin. He is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Please welcome Mark Samuels. Thank you. To his left, Jim Dunford is the managing director for the American Experience. He is responsible for directing the series strategies and communications, audience development, post-production, and digital elements. He also collaborates with the editorial team on content development and strategic planning. He first joined the American Experience staff back in 2000, holding several roles, including series manager. He spent more than 25 years in public media, most recently serving as the director of board relations for WGBH in Boston. He is a graduate of Boston College. He was also on the adjunct faculty at the college teaching courses in media writing and programming for over 20 years. He's won many media awards, including a New England Emmy and served in several telly awards. He also served as quarterback of the New England Patriots. No, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. It, ends, it ended right there. Like, wait, where did that go? <laughs> uh, please give a round for Jim Dunford. <laughs> So this is exciting. Um, this is the second time I've had a chance to uh, to see these, and the thing that I was worried is that you know the four-hour series isn't going to be long enough, and the time that we have to chat isn't going to be long enough. We're going to have time for questions from the audience as well. Um, so please start thinking of things as we go along. But you know, I think one of the questions that uh, probably a lot of people um, will, would think is in the, the the years of research that go into putting a, a documentary like this together, was there anything that you found that surprised you, not about Walt the brand or Walt the business, but really about Walt the man? Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Lou. I, first of all, I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I really, really appreciate it. It's a real honor for us to bring this film to one of the real epicenters of the Walt Disney story here in Central Florida and to be with WUCF and Polly. And it's just a real pleasure for us to come down from Boston and uh, share this with you. We're really excited about this film. We've been working on it for three years. Um, it's really unprecedented. Um, I would say that the, one of the biggest surprises that I had as we were uh, working on the film, and Sarah Colt, who's the producer of the film, and I were talking about it, was, you know, you could, there's many people in this room, I'm sure, that know an awful lot about Walt Disney, but I just knew Walt Disney from the guy who was in the living room on Sunday night when I was a kid, and I'd go in with my sisters and watch him on TV, and he was on top of the world when I saw him. You know, he had the theme park, he had the TV shows, he had the movies, and it just looked all so effortless. He was Uncle Walt, and he was so assured. And I just thought, wow, someone's had a charmed life. Someone's actually gotten to the top so easily. And what you really find out is that Walt Disney struggled and clawed his way and persevered against great obstacles within his family, within his corporation, within the industry. And he fought, fought, fought. He had a vision and a passion. He wasn't a saint, but he was someone who was totally dedicated to what he wanted to do. And he brought on a whole lot of people, and he created the most remarkable body of work in American cultural history. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see how the documentary is going to really humanize the man and, and all of his flaws and faults that we all have. Um, but, you know, why now and why choose Walt Disney um, for the American experience where you've done, you know, so many presidential documentaries and things like that in the past? So, just a brief introduction, and Jim can jump here at any time. Right. Now, American Experience uh, is in its 27th season. We're the longest running history series on television, the most watched on television. Uh, we've done some 300 films uh, about American history, uh, biographies, events, and we've done 16 presidential biographies over that time. And they're pretty definitive pieces, um, four hours usually. 
And so uh, when we first conceived this film, we thought, you know, who is more important in American cultural history in the 20th century in particular than Walt Disney? We had just done a film about Henry Ford, who we felt really laid claim to being one of the pivotal figures in the 20th century, he introduced mobility and the industrial process and all that. But his counterpart in many ways in culture is Walt Disney, huge impact. And so we felt there was a natural subject for us and that we should give him, in a way, the presidential treatment because of that. And so in terms of, you know, we talk about humanizing Walt, um, what kind of differences will we see between Walt, the man, the father, the husband, and Walt, sort of the myth? Yeah. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting is the project started out, and it was going to be a two-hour biography um, of Walt Disney. And then through the access we were able to get to the Disney archive, we really realized that to understand the man, you really needed to sort of start to understand the work. And when you think about the body of work, um, that he was responsible for, you know, Snow White, which we saw the clip from, you know, was the first of what they call the big five in Disney, which is Snow White, Pinocchio, Dumbo, Bambi, and Fantasia. And those were done in a period of about six years. So I think it became really evident that we needed to be able to tell both the story of the man, but also, you know, the work. And for me, when you asked about surprises, he was never satisfied. You know, I think, you know, Mickey Mouse shorts became, you know, the full-length feature of Snow White, became, you know, the big five, became live action, became nature documentaries, became theme parks. He just was constantly pushing forward to the next thing and not sitting back and saying, like, okay, now, you know, I've, I've cracked that nut. I don't need to do anything else. And I think that really was what sort of, you know, drives the narrative of the story. Yeah, and when you undertake a project like this, obviously one that can't be told in a half hour, an hour or two, or probably couldn't even be told in four hours, I'm sure you could, could have gone on longer, you know, it was interesting for me to see through the, the clips that we saw that you didn't just get access to information, but you have stories from Dick Sherman and, and Floyd, and also, but how important was it and how did you work, not just with the people that knew and worked for and with Walt, but you know, the, the Walt's family, and more importantly, the Disney company itself, because in order to, to tell the story, you have to have the access. Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that Sarah Cope, the filmmaker, was able to do is she brings together a collection of voices, a lot of you saw in the clips tonight, you know, both scholars who spent a lot of time, Neil Gabler, and um, spent 10 years writing his um, biography of Walt Disney. You know, so we have people like Neil, we have people like Carmenita Higginbotham, who's an art historian from the University of Virginia. She teaches a course on Disney. And to your point, we also have lots of people who worked with Walt, Richard Sherman um, being one of the voices in the film that I love listening to his stories. But then there is that point where you have to um, kind of put, take that all together and, and create something. And the family always, even when we do presidential biographies, the role of the family is always um, sort of an interesting one. Because in many ways, they're not going to necessarily give you great insight. They're going to give you um, the message from the family. Sarah was able to spend um, some serious time, three or four hours at the Disney Family Museum with Diane, his daughter, before um, she unfortunately passed away. I think she would have been interviewed for the film otherwise. His son-in-law, Ron Miller, is in the film. But I think it's important to, that it's that range. It's the scholars, it's the eyewitnesses, it's the people who work with them. But as public media journalists, how do you ensure that you retain that, that objectivity that you need? Well, it's not only objectivity, it's editorial integrity. And I say that the thing that, we, you know, I said we've been around, well, maybe I didn't say, we've been around for 27 years, we're the longest <laughs> thing. So um, we've been around a long time. And, you know, a couple of people have said to me, that, oh, good question. What took you so long to make something about Walt Disney? It's a, good, it's a fair question. And one of the things that took us so long was that the Disney Corporation, uh, because Walt Disney is their namesake, is their brand, has been very controlling about everything to do with Walt Disney. Um, early on, when I was looking into this project, uh, someone told me that there are approximately 8,000 images of Walt Disney, and 7,800 plus are held by the Disney Archive in Burbank. So there's very little out there. There's you know, the motion pictures and, and all the material that you see, and, and certainly we all know that you can't use any of the films or any of the TV shows uh, without Disney's permission. And um, 
you know, rightly so, the Disney Corporation keeps those closed, very closed. And they were very famous for not releasing that to third parties. And so I went out a few years ago and started a series of conversations with the Disney Corporation about the possibility of making a film. I fully expected that we would not be allowed to do it. And in the end, we were given unprecedented access. Access that didn't rely upon any editorial involvement from the Disney Corporation. They have not seen any of this. No one from we have not provided any bit of the film to the Disney. They're going to see it on September 14th when you see it. In the entire thing, and that was the arrangement and the agreement from the beginning, um, and that was essential to us. And I think it was only because, frankly, Lou, of um, our track record with doing 16 presidential biographies, um, that I was that I gave several of them to the Disney people I was talking with. And they watched them. They thought that they were fair, and they were on some polarizing figures: Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton. Uh, and because of the integrity of um, public television, CBS, and that integrity begins at stations with stations like WCF here in, in Florida. And you know, we weren't going to do a drive-by, quickie biography of Walt. We were going to put in the time and spent two years making it. We weren't going to do it in a half an hour. We weren't going to do it in an hour. I'm sure in the four hours there's going to be people that are looking and go, "How could they possibly have left out that?" <laughs> and you know. <laughs> My goodness. Give Mark's <laughs> email. And There's a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor with you in four hours, but I'm telling you, when I told CBS that we were doing four hours in Walt Disney, he said, four hours? He's not a president. I said, well, this is it's awfully important. So trust me on this. Well, speaking of important, you know, you know, Walt and, and Mickey, um, as Bob was saying, they're, they're synonymous and really, they would just, and interestingly enough, you know, Mickey was really born out of some of the darkest times in Walt's career and a lot of things that people don't necessarily know about. But he is described uh, by a number of people as Walt's alter ego. Um, do you think, in your research, do you think that Mickey was a way to sort of humanize, um, to be able to humanize Walt, or maybe for a Walt, a way for Walt to cope with his own personal demons and feelings. I mean, I think one of the things that, that comes out in the film and even in the, the clip we shared earlier tonight is, is Mickey absolutely was in, the, in many ways that, you know, Walt had a tough childhood. He absolutely had a tough childhood. He became incredibly family oriented by, you know, he was a, a good um, father to his two daughters. And I think that Mickey was in many ways, um, he wanted people to have fun. He wanted people to enjoy things, and I think Mickey became the personification of that. I mean, it's interesting, you know, the, the one of the taglines, you know, the branding taglines that um, Disney uses is it all started with a mouse, and I think in many ways it did. What was interesting is a few weeks ago, I think someone, some of you in the audience may have been at D23, the Disney fan convention. Um, Oswald, which is the precursor, precursor to, to Mickey. Oswald's now making a comeback, so I saw lots of Oswald t-shirts and things like that. But I do think Mickey became, um, you know, as Gabler says in the film, Walt's alter ego. Yeah, I just love the fact that we got, we, like I will, like we got Oswald back in a trade for, for, uh, for a sports broadcaster, so. Um, <laughs> you know, one thing that's interesting too, is you, you can, you saw a little bit in the clip, um, was that, Disney and his studios really started to take hold and, and be successful and really thrive, actually during the, the Depression. Mm -hmm. Is it at this point that Walt becomes um, the American icon? And do you think that in some ways, what Walt was doing and the, the films and even the products he was making sort of almost helped America get through this tough time? Absolutely. You know, I think one of the things that we always look for in a, in a subject is the relationship of a subject to the greater picture of America. Because I, I think if you could define the mission of our series in any way, it's to, it's to try to form a picture of this great experiment that began in 1776 called America and try to understand what it is. And it's an evolving, dynamic picture. And for each one of our films, we try to add one more little puzzle piece to that picture. And Walt Disney has a big puzzle piece to it. He helps form sort of the ethos, um, one, one ethos, uh, idea of an ethos that, that formulates our idea of not only art and entertainment, but how we think about the world. And I think that, you know, the 1930s was a really acutely difficult time. 
And yet, it was a time when Walt Disney thrived. And he thrived in part because he came out at the right time with this innovative new creature and this new entity of, of cartoons that built around Mickey Mouse. He also thrived at a time because he had this merchandise which spoke to hope and grit and determination and all those things that Americans were looking for in those hard times. And so his timing was impeccable, I think, with Walt, with Mickey Mouse. And, and I think, too, Walt, um, you know, he broke, he broke so many rules, not in a, re a rebellious kind of way, but an innovative kind of way. You know, when he was frustrated by the limits of technology, he just went out and invented it himself. What do you, do you how, how do you think Walt's sort of unique style of, of tackling problems and changing the way we viewed family entertainment led to his immense popularity, not just with you know, children, but with, so, obviously, so many adults as well. I mean, one, one of the things that I think this is a good opportunity to remind folks, and when you see the film, you'll understand this better for those of you who don't know the story, is there was also behind him his brother Roy. And so for every sort of creative genius and for every innovator, there needs to be somebody who's sort of minding the store and holding the checkbook and trying to keep things running. And that was very much the role of Roy. And I think Walt was lucky that he had Roy to play that role. Um, and, an, and another issue that I think comes up in the Walt Disney story is he was an artist, but as the company grew, he was sort of taken further and further away from um, that process. And I think he was always looking for ways to go back to that. And I think that Roy um, enabled him to do that. And then again, as I said earlier, his sort of the restless, okay, what can I do next? I think all played into that. Yeah, and, and it was a great balance that he had with his, with his brother. And he surrounded himself by the people who were the very best at what they did. Um, during uh, one of the clips that we got to see, we got a little peek into some of the, the tougher times um, with the uh, the studio beginning to talk about union organization. Um, and it seemed like Walt was sort of unfazed, um, you know, because he was maybe so disconnected from this employee base that was growing so very rapidly. He couldn't, you know, he used to say that he was a bumblebee, he would go to flower to flower, but he couldn't be the bumblebee and touch every single person. Was he really unfazed by what was going on? And when he finally did realize it, or when it was brought to his attention, what did they start to do to resolve some of these employee complaints? Well, I, uh, Lou, actually, I, I wouldn't say that he was unfazed. I would say that he was um, befuddled by it. Um, you know, Walt Disney was able to create stories that were universal and still are universal. I mean, that's why you have every nationality on this planet showing up to Disney World and Disneyland because his stories are touching deep, deep, deep universal. If he were to do his own story, he would find a universal in the story. And the universal is, is that his success came around to distance him from the thing that he loved most, which was touching the art that he was making, immersing himself in the storytelling and the cell construction and the music and the dancing and all that. He was fully up to his elbows in those great films in the 1930s and 19, early 1940s. And yet the company's success grew and grew and grew until, as you saw, he was a man up in the office with the bank of secretaries in front. And he'd lost touch with that. And he'd lost that spark. To be honest with you, the way the story unfolds in Sarah's film, you know, he loses that spark for a period of time. And it's really only when he leaves the Disney studio, forms WED, and starts to dream about this theme park called Disneyland, that he regains that kind of immersive, tactile sense of working on his passion, and it revitalizes him. I want to actually touch on the theme parks, but just you, you talked about his, you know, universal this and universal that. Just FYI, Mark, when you're down in Central Florida talking to Disney fans, you don't say the U word at all in conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, what's a synonym for what's a synonym for known around the world? Global, global, <laughs> global. Uh, human. How about human? Human. Is there a human theme yes. park there? Yes. <laughs> so he uh, is speaking about um, again this radical idea of, of immersing his audience and guests in a, in a in a 3D environment where they're no longer sort of passive observers, but they are active participants in it. You know, he took a lot of inspiration from his travels and from his personal experiences, and it also sort of goes back again to his childhood growing up in small town Missouri. 
how important do you think growing up in that sort of very simple Midwestern roots were to his career? And do you think that the parks were his attempt, especially Main Street USA, to sort of recreate that as an adult? Okay. Well, and he wants me to answer because I'm from the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> anybody here from Marceline or from Missouri? Is anybody here from Missouri? Oh my God. All right. Welcome. <laughs> Um, you know, this, I'm sure most of you know that, you know, Walt Disney spent four years in a small town in Missouri, Marceline, and it was a real touchstone for his whole life. He, um, he lived on a farm, and things were relatively calm. Home wasn't always calm for Walt. He had a pretty stern father, pretty difficult, um, you know, you know, father struggled actually to make a living most of the time. But this, this moment is a sort of a, peaceful, serene moment in the countryside with the animals and the farm and everything. And, you know, if you look at a lot of the things that he created, you find a character, in a way, searching to find that moment, to find that peace. Um, you know, I would say the two things that, that the film really, I think, the themes that it draws out strongly are that, like Mickey Mouse, Walt Disney considered himself a little bit of an outsider. You know, he was never really at the center of the Hollywood thing that he became a part of. It's hard to imagine how Walt Disney couldn't be at the epicenter of Hollywood power, but he never was. You know, he never got that best feature film Oscar, which he so deserved. And he never got that kind of respect. Mary Poppins gave him a little bit of respect at the end, but that's pretty late. In addition to feeling like an outsider, he, he really strongly felt that there was um, there was a place out there that if if you were struggling, if you were an underdog, and if you were you know had some odds against you, if you stuck to what you really were passionate about and you really believed in, you could find your way back to that light. And that light for him is in many ways represented by those moments in Marcelin. You know, I'm sure the, um, the the documentary is going to touch on you know the. the um, unfortunately early and, and tragic end to, to Walt's life. Can you tell us a little bit about um, Walt at that time? And, you know, how did he look at his place in, in pop culture, about his accomplishments, um, you know, his regrets, and did he maybe feel like he paid a, a, a huge personal price for creating you know, the empire that he did? I mean, I'm not sure it, it's that as much as, you know, in his hospital room, you know, um, as he was dying, he was still saying to Roy, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. And certainly, you know, relatively late in his career, you know, breaking off and starting WVD, I think all of those things spoke to he was not finished. He was absolutely not finished. And I think, you know, Mark talked about um, the Mary Poppins, and I think Mary Poppins for him was the nomination, mm -hmm. but I think he probably would have liked to win the prize. Yeah. You know, we saw the little clip of, you know, all the animals and the dwarves surrounding Sweet, uh, Snow White when she's dying. You know, Walt Disney who created this, you know, this cast of thousands in this empire. You know, the final moment, it's Roy and Walt, the two brothers, you know, kid brothers dying. And Walt's pointing up at a picture of Epcot and telling Roy what needs to be done because he's got to carry on. He's got to do it. It's a really moving moment. Yeah, we, you know, people speculate all the time. What would Walt think of Epcot and why didn't they? And so many people that, that I've talked to, I'm sure you did too, you know, when Walt passed and they had this vision of what Epcot was supposed to be, they didn't have everything else that was, you know, and they sort of looked at each other and said, well, what do we, now what do we do? You know, because we don't have our leader. He didn't explain to us how to actually go about executing mm -hmm. on this vision. It's very true. I mean, the, you know, I don't want to give away the ending of the movie, <laughs> but I, I will say at the end, um, you know, as much as, as he had of iWorks and all these incredible artists and, you know, just thousands of really talented people that, that worked for him, at the end, what you hear is one by one, people come out and say, when they heard the news, it just felt like life had something had been sucked out of life, and uh, you know, and I think something major, vision, had been 
And you know, there just wasn't anybody that stuck in the way she never could be. In the, uh, in the last clip, which made me cry, because I cry every time I hear what's go fly a kite, um, we saw Mary Poppins, which is my favorite movie. Um, a lot of us who live here in Central Florida know that a lot of what we have here in terms of Walt Disney World came, was funded by the, the profits um, from that film. We also know, thanks to stories and saving Mr. Banks, that it was not the easiest movie in the world to make um, for, for many reasons. Um, but aside from the stories that maybe we saw in, in that, that film, which obviously was, was not a documentary type film, what can you share with us about Walt's direct involvement in terms of the making of Mary Poppins and getting that film finally made? I mean, I think it was going back to Walt as a dad. I do think at its core it was about fulfilling a promise he had made to his two young daughters, so I think from that perspective. And I think, you know, the, the clip and Carmen Eva sort of eloquently says it, it was definitely for him you know, to present that family in that way, and I think that was really important to him. I think that what's interesting about um, that sort of moment in his career is Walt always looked at one project as a way to pay for the next project, so I think, as, as you say, you know, Mary Poppins, the success of that film allowed him to put more money into the theme parks and into the idea of Epcot, so that was always the way he worked, and it was always Roy who was saying, like, okay, you know, We've done Snow White, can we take a break? No, 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 now we're going to do Bambi. And I think that those projects always did that, and I think Mary Poppins was that project for him at that point. And I'm happy you mentioned the, the personal connection to his family. Uh, my favorite Walt quote is that a man should never neglect his family for business. And, and, I, and I'm sure the film will show, you know, as busy as Walt was running the studio and dealing with all these different issues, you know, he drove his daughter to school, and Saturday was Daddy's Day, and, and that's one of the things that, that I love and, and admire about him. But you, as, as the, the, the filmmakers, what did you learn, or what was sort of that aha moment or thing that you found surprising or interesting um, about Walt while making the film itself? Well, I will say first that there is that moment with Walt and his family, and the, and the footage that um, Sarah and her team were able to, to get um, out and, and really bring to light for the first time is really stunning. Like, you know, that the, just to you know, give a shout out to her and her team, you know, that, that footage of Walt at that party that we saw in that clip, you know, is, that was from the attic of uh, Art Babbitt. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that, that kind of, there's material like that that has been seldom or never seen before. And so you do get a sense of Walt, the family man with his kids, and he's in the pool, and he's on the train and stuff like that. And, really, and that really comes through. And it's one thing to sort of say he was that, you know, and it's another thing to sort of see and see them, the, the sparkle in their eyes towards them. Um, I would say that the, you know, the <clears throat> most surprising thing that I learned, and I, I learned a lot, I didn't know that much about him, as I said beforehand, is, um, you know, it, I, I didn't realize how strong his passion was for um, taking a step beyond the conventional and the, no, and the known, that he was never satisfied with just doing something well that had been done. It had to be that one extra step, that one extra thing that could be added that would maybe push us into new ground. So you've got to, you've got to bring in this three-dimensional camera that we've all seen pictures of that powers up, and you've got to have these multi-plane cameras and be able to move through it, because you've got to make it feel like it's real. And you've got to get that dancing just right. So we're going to bring in the ballerina. She's going to dance for the animators. They're going to get it just right. Because it's not just going to be a sketch and just be a proxima. It's going to be actually how they twirled and moved and how the facial expressions were going to be. And they had to be real. And you know, now we have all these technological tools and we can put you know, um, equipment on people and get their animation moves just right and get it easy. And technology is kind of taking place with that. It was really one drive to get that done, that made it happen in those films. I want to, um, I want to bring it back to Central Florida. Um, obviously, we're talking about, you know, at his passing, his unrealized dream was not just Epcot, but his, his Florida project. Um, again, his brother comes out of sort of semi-retirement to fulfill his vision and to name it Walt Disney World. Um, we know he didn't spend a lot of time here. We have seen some clips here and there of Walt sort of walking the property very early on. But can you tell us, um, or maybe share with us, anything that you found in your research about 
his direct involvement or, or presence here in, uh, in Central Florida? I mean, I think one of the you know, challenges for the film is that it is a biography, and so it has the end date, if you will. And I think that um, you know, ending in 1966, Florida was you know, just beginning. He had bought some land down here. He had done those things. But, but I think you know, there isn't a lot that I learned in the sort of you know, what would have come next, other than that you know, on his hospital bed, he was telling Roy what needed to happen. Yeah, there's a nice clip in the film with, with the press conference with Walt and the governor of Florida, and the governor's pressing him for, now, when are you going to open it, and what's it going to be, and how big is it going to be, and what's it going to do here, yeah. and what's it that? And Walt's like, um, uh, well, we're, we're working on that. <laughs> we'll let you know when we figure we'll it out. Yeah. We'll get back to you. We'll get back to you on that one. Excellent. Um, I'd love to make sure we have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, I know that we have a microphone coming around. I think there's somebody out in the back. In the back, left corner. This has really been an honor and a little great job moderating as always. I'm curious, Walt Disney, the businessman, it was not uncommon for business people in that era who had their name on the company to be authoritarian, to be benign dictators at the time. Can you talk about the company culture from a business standpoint that you uncovered? A good deal of the film deals with that, and it, it, because not, he was not only a cultural figure, but he was actually a, a financial, financial and business figure as well, and that's what drew us to the story. You know, um, I don't know if that's his strength, really, to be honest with you. I think that comes through and everybody talks about it. He, he saw what he had created as a family. He called his animators his boys, and you know, at the time, across the industry, there was a really low glass ceiling for, ceiling for women, and he wasn't, you know, alone in keeping women down to a certain level, even though later he'll, he'll be blamed for that. Um, and you know, when it was just a handful of people, and they were creating the early stuff, you know, it probably did feel like a family. It probably did run, but he also just you know, ran the finances into the ground. And Roy had to constantly go up to San Francisco and get more and more money from Bank of America. <laughs> and they got further and further into debt. And he said, now this time they're giving us a loan and we got to deliver the product to the distributor and we got to get the payment. We got to pay them back by December. And December would come and go and then March would come and go and he'd still be working on the thing and making it better and better. So in many ways, I think you got to give Roy credit for holding this thing together until it gels. And it doesn't really gel financially for a long, long time. I mean, it's not, you know, Mickey Mouse is paying off the debt for all the things that didn't work. And then Snow White is paying off all the debt for the stuff that didn't work between Mickey and Snow White. And it's not really until the sum of the end revenues are coming in from Snow White that they're able to breathe. Yeah, and I think that goes to the point of, of Walt being the dreamer and, and Roy being the doer, exactly. um, you know, in, in throughout the entire relationship. So, and I think it's going to be interesting to, to watch, you know, we talk about Walt in business. You know, Walt as a leader, Walt as a boss, I think we're going to glean some very interesting lessons from him, but we're also going to see that, you know, Walt was probably not the easiest guy to, to work for. But he knew just how to pull the very best from the people that worked from that for him. I, you know, we heard Richard Sherman at the <laughs> top of the film say, you know, you'd say, I have a great idea. And Walt would say, uh, you have an idea, I'll tell you if it's a great <laughs> idea. And I think that says a lot. And that's coming from a guy who we were fortunate to spend a fair amount of time with the last couple of months. He's just a great 87-year-old kid. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and he considered Walt really his father, yeah. his surrogate father. I mean, his brother. And, I mean, when he know, and his brother came into the company, Walt, you know, was absolutely treated him like his son. Yeah, and he, he was a tough. He mm -hmm. was, he was tough. He was but you see the reverence and the respect they I, have for him as and, well. And, and I think what comes out in a lot of the people who work for Walt is that they wanted to please him, and they knew that his quest for perfectionism was only making it all better. And you couldn't say no. You got you maybe said no once, and, and you never <laughs> said no no <laughs> again. Because he was right so often. That's the problem. <laughs> Terrible to have a boss who's right. <laughs> Anybody else? There has to be somebody else in the class. Got one more, Lou. <laughs> Thank you. 
When you have lived in Central Florida for 30 years, every time the ticket prices went up, more went for parking, whatever the case may be, you would hear people say, oh, Walt would be rolling over in his grave. How untrue is that, or how true is that? Is that a question for me? <laughs> I was just going to say, I, yeah. You ask, well, you can't research speculation, so um, I'm not going to speculate on what Walt would roll over in his grave about. I'm sorry. I, I don't know, honestly, I mean, what he would think. I think, you know, he would, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, I, I, I don't know. He, you know, he, it, the stuff was expensive when he was. You know what I, I, I would. You know what I would tell you. I, I would tell you to go into Magic Kingdom and look at the partner statue, where he's standing there with Mickey, mm -hmm. and he's holding his hand out. And people have speculated for years. You know what is he pointing to? Is he pointing to Epcot? Is he pointing to the future? And what he's saying to Mickey is, "Look, look at how happy all these people are." And I think that's what he would look to. Is mm -hmm. he's not the prices and the things, and he wouldn't. He hopefully Walt wouldn't pay attention to Twitter. Um, but actually, you probably would pay attention to Twitter, but hopefully it would be Unless the same thing. Unless it's from this event. Right. <laughs> um, hopefully, he'd see, you know, he'd see tens of millions of happy guests and, and people. He was out. so transmedia. I mean, my God, he was into everything, you know, he was getting television to pay for a theme park, and he was getting the merchandise to pay for the films. I think he'd be all over social media. I oh, think he would, he'd be he'd taking be, selfies in Disneyland uh, left and right, so... <laughs> Just a question, the uh, Disney social network's pretty broad, and uh, we'll be talking with our friends and family about this uh, film. Is this going to be broadcast on PBS nationwide on the 14th yes. and 15th? Yes, so it's, oh, it's broadcast nationwide on PBS September 14th and 15th, um, and then on the Wednesday, which is the 16th, the four hours will be streaming online for a limited time as well. Yeah, we're in 98% of American households. This is everywhere. Anybody else? Yes. Right up. Hi. Uh, you mentioned uh, access to a lot of material uh, from the Walt Disney Company. Uh, were there any specific executives or people within the Walt Disney Company that were, uh, you know, I'm curious at how high a level and who was kind of responsible at making those kind of decisions? Uh, because I got to believe that's got to go to the top. Sure. So um, let me just, this is a good opportunity to acknowledge um, right. one of the people in the project, Becky Klein, who is in charge of the Disney Archive, um, was really incredibly um, helpful, her and her team. And in many ways, Sarah and her team were going into the archives and um, there were things that hadn't been released and there wasn't mechanisms in place. And so Becky and her team really worked really hard to make sure that Sarah had that access and could get all of those materials out of the archives and to be able to use them. Um, I will, in answering the other part of your question, quote Becky herself, who I think when Mark first, you know, had the meetings um, at Disney Corporate to get this permission, you know, I, I can't for sure say how high up, you know, the, the chain it went, but Becky at D23 a few weeks ago said that, you know, what she told folks is, you know, she looked at the track record of American Experience and of PBS and said, to everyone, you know, at, in the company, all the way up to Bob Iger, that you know, this were people who we should trust. So I feel like, from that perspective, you know, it, it, it was a company-wide decision. But I don't know that we could, you know, I wouldn't necessarily quote Iger at this point. It, it had to be pretty high because, even though they're the biggest entertainment corporation in the world and they have, you know, all the resources you can imagine that they have, uh, they had. They had never gotten stuff out to give to somebody. It's like if someone asking you, you've never really shared your attic with anybody, and you got to go up and go, now where is that box, and what am I going to do with that? And I know where it is, but I've never even gotten it, cracked it open and gotten it out. It's not like this stuff has never, ever been used before, but they didn't have a mechanism to service an, an external entity like us who had a pretty voracious appetite for photographs and motion pictures and line drawings and things like that. They just, you, you could feel that they were doing this for the first time. These were not muscles that they had used before. 
I mean, one of the things that um, we heard in the process is, you know, for Sleeping Beauty, there were something like 18 three-ring binders of story notes because Walt had every story meeting transcribed um, and, and put into notes that he could refer back to. So that, you know, that's one film in a, you know, volume of films. So there's a tremendous amount of material to go through. And the other interesting thing that we dealt with over the last couple of years, you probably remember exactly the films I don't, but every now and again we'd say, oh, we'd hear from them, oh, well, we can't really help you with all those requests right now because we were opening whatever film was, was coming up frozen or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, and it'd be like, you know, the whole company kind of gets directed towards this <laughs> thing. And it's like, wait, but wait, we got to, we're, we're still going <laughs> We still need here. to do, right. <laughs> but I love the fact that next Monday, Everybody at the Disney Company, including Bob Iger, will be sitting on the couch in their pajamas watching PBS. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, you know, when you're watching next week, they're like, you know what? Bob Iger's sitting back watching the exact same thing at the exact same time because he hasn't seen it yet either. Hey, how you doing? Um, just a quick question. What didn't you have access to? Did you have any kind of uh, anything that blocked anything that you really wanted to uh, take a look at? Was there anything that they said, no, nah, we don't really want you to look at it? No. No, and I think the other thing, in addition to the Disney Company, um, the Disney Family Museum, we had the same situation with them in terms of getting access to their materials. Um, so there are other, you know, everything you see on screen isn't, doesn't necessarily belong to the Disney company, but there wasn't anything that they said, oh no, you know, we don't want you to look in that box. Uh, we, I don't think we would have gotten into an agreement with them if they would have walled off some stuff at the beginning. You know, we were after the whole story. Anybody else? Um, it's been interesting lately that so much more stuff has been coming out about Walt Disney and, you know, like the, we just recently saw him for the first time um, on screen in Saving Mr. Banks. Do you personally, either of you feel like there's a reason for that or did you discover anything of, like, there's new information coming out that hasn't been previously released and is, like, what is America's draw to learn more about Walt Disney, like, at this time? I think that's a great question. I, I honestly don't know if there's a renewed interest in him at this moment. It, it, it feels a little bit more coincidental that Saving Mr. Banks came out and now our biography of him is coming out. I, I think maybe within the corporation that you know the experience of allowing a fictional account of Walt Disney and for to have him be played by an actor and the sky didn't fall was maybe maybe helped things a little bit, but. To be honest with you, we were already in production when mm -hmm. Saving Mr. Banks came out, so I can't really say that it was cause and effect, but um, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, maybe you can tell me that, the, that his interest in Walt Disney has waxed and waned over the year, but it, he seems pretty front and center to me all the time. I mean, the other, again, we were also in production when it happened, but when Steve Jobs died, I think a lot of people were trying to figure out who was mm -hmm. Steve Jobs like. But I, again, you know, we were already in production, Saving Mr. Banks was already in production, but I think there are, to your question, a handful of people who sort of merit this constant looking at, and I think Walt Disney is, is for sure one of them. Well, I think too, you know, one thing that excites me about the film is not just learning about Walt the person, but looking at it from a, a business perspective, and I think with this incredible sense of entrepreneurship that's going on, I mean, Walt was the consummate entrepreneur, you know, he was, he was making things happen, and I think I'm interested to look and learn from it from a, a business perspective too, because one of the things that caught me was we think, you know, uh, of Walt as obviously somebody who believed, in, you know, wholeheartedly in what he did. He mortgaged everything he had on it. But I found it interesting when he was talking about Snow White, when he was describing it to the NBC reporter, he says, I hope that people aren't too disappointed. He looked at it as like, they're going to be disappointed. I hope they're not too disappointed, as opposed to, I think this is going to be a, a smashing success. Well, I hope people aren't too disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> it worked for Walt, though. <laughs> Hello? Oh, Hello. <laughs> You're live. I'm going to stand up. Okay. I just was wondering what kind of response do you think this is going to have? I mean, I am a big Walt Disney fan, and seeing it, some parts, maybe some people will be uncomfortable, especially after seeing Saving Mr. Banks. 
and maybe a more um, polished or sugar-coated, I guess, view of Walt, especially since it came out from the Disney company, maybe not having him smoke, not showing a side of him where he was maybe unhappy with things or frustrated. Mm -hmm. Do you think it will be hard for some Disney fans to watch it or show a different side? That's a great question, and we've been anticipating this, and Jim, you should weigh in on this too. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. I think that, you know, we've already experienced, and Jim has experienced firsthand just very recently, the passionate adoration that there is for Walt Disney. You know, quite justified in many ways, you know, but it's, uh, it's an adoration that may, you know, not have a high degree of tolerance for seeing his human faults, his human side. And uh, I think there's going to be that. And I think there's also going to be the feeling that, you know, we didn't drive the nail into him. You know, there's so many swirling things. You know, Walt was a Nazi supporter and Walt was a woman hater and Walt was a this and Walt was a that. These kind of, you know, these myths that have risen up around him. And why didn't you deal with that? And so I think the people that really you know, don't love Walt Disney and don't love his view of, of life are, are also going to come out. But hopefully, the vast number of the millions of people that are going to see this are going to, to not have such extreme views towards Walt and find something new, something fresh. And, you know, if they love Walt Disney, that love will be reinforced and renewed. And if they're skeptical about Walt Disney, maybe they'll still retain some of that skepticism because he's a dominating, powerful figure in our psyche and in our culture. I think the strength of the film is that we do bring together a lot of, of voices and a lot of things that people know and don't know. And I think for us as a series, our track record, you know, again, as Mark said, the presidential biographies and things like that, you are never going to please everybody. Um, and, and so I think our goal here is to you know, illuminate the subject um, and not necessarily try to fit into one camp or another. And in fact, if we do fit into a camp, I think we've failed. Yeah, it's, um, no other company, I think, has the brand loyalty. And, and clearly, I think we all have such an emotional connection, not just to the brand, but to the person. So my advice on Monday is to stay off Twitter. Just ignore it completely because <laughs> <laughs> don't watch the live tweeting as it, as it goes on. So, um, but I think that you have a, um, a lot of Disney enthusiasts who are just excited. I know, me personally, as a, as a fan, you know, this is sort of what we've been waiting for for, for a long, long time. So, um, anybody else have any questions? Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, after the film was completed, after all your research, what's the one thing that you guys thought were amazing about the man Walt Disney that blew you away prior? I'm, I'm going to answer first. It was his brother, Roy. <laughs> <laughs> Roy was amazing. Roy was amazing. I just, I, you know, I, it, it, when you look at Disney from a distance and, you know, it's the, you know, how did he do it? How did he do it? And I think for me, um, as, as the story took shape to see the role that Roy played, Roy was a reason why Walt was able to do what he did, and I, I certainly did not know that before this project. I like the early Walt. I like the Walt who's like risked everything in Kansas City and nothing really gelled. He, he made some advances in animation and did Lapagram and some cool stuff there, but it basically all collapses <laughs> at his feet. And he gets on a train with, with nothing to go out to California because that's where his brother who's got tuberculosis has had to go. And, uh, you know, he shows up here in California, like so many people still do show up in California with a, with a dream and a hope. And, he, you know, he just never gives in to defeat, never gives in to sour grapes, never gives in to not having privilege and not having money and not having the ease. He just keeps fighting. I mean, so when you look at his, the characters, the memorable characters, you see that fight. You see that grit and determination. And it, it, that just really uh, is an admirable trait in anybody. 
Please join me in thanking Lou Mangello, Mark Samuels, and Jim Dunford. Thank you, guys. And thank you all for being here tonight. We are relying on you to help us get the word out. As you heard, this program is Monday and Tuesday, the 14th and 15th at 9 p.m., only on WUCF here in Central Florida, and we cover nine counties and almost four million people, but all across America, everyone with free over-the-air television. You don't have to have cable. You don't have to have satellite dish. You can get this free. So help us get the word out about this program. We are so proud to be your PBS station here in Central Florida. We're the America's newest and fastest-growing PBS station. We're very proud to, to be that. And I'll tell you what, I'm always, I've been a big American Experience fan for a long time, but I, and I think I can speak for our entire team, that we are so proud to be the station and the only station that will bring American Experience Walt Disney to Central Florida. So thank you for oh, what you do. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't have a pulpit, but I'll give you just the 30 seconds. Um, we hope that you're all members of WUCF-TV. If you're not, we can help you with that. Uh, we have some folks <laughs> out in the lobby, uh, or you can always go to WUCFTV.org, uh, but our, our folks at the registration tables out front would be happy to help you with that. If you were notified on Twitter that you were a winner of the trivia contest, you can pick up your prize out there as well. And um, let's see, before you leave, we also have surveys out, and we'd love for you to take a survey about the event, help us to do more events, better events. Um, let's thank also the great folks here at the, Winter, at the Garden Theater, here in Winter Garden. Thank you, you did a great job. We appreciate it. So again, thank you all for coming. Enjoy the all four hours on the 14th and 15th of September. Thanks again for coming. Thank you, guys.